Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us for this special Saturday episode of the show. I really appreciate you listening as always and can't thank you enough. For tonight's show, we plan to have both Werewolf Mike and David Butt come on, but for some reason, something's happened to Dave. He hasn't shown up. I contacted him just about an hour or so ago and he was all go, but like I said, for some reason, he's not here. So we're going to push forward with just Mike and myself and do it that way. But having said that, let's bring Mike in now. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Vic. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You are welcome. Mike, for the people who've missed the shows you've come on and done in the past, please tell them about yourself. Um, my name's Ian Michael Wood, uh, 59, uh, born in Manchester, uh, 1964, uh, grew up in Cheshire. Uh, which is a rural county in northwest England. Uh, I was in the army in the 80s and 90s. And ever since then, I've been in um, corporate security. Mike, I'm going to ask the question that I think probably 90% of the listeners are wondering about right now. Okay. Your name is Ian Wood, but you go by Werewolf Mike. Where did the whole yeah. Werewolf Mike thing come from? That, that was uh, given to me by Debbie Hatswell of uh, being believed uh, research BBR uh, which is one of the largest organizations in this country but uh, they, they mainly um, uh, research what we call uh, what you would call Sabe or Sasquatch over here we call them wild men or Vilvauza or Vilvus um, and I, I sort of got into um, uh, Debbie with that organization and she sort of christened me werewolf Mike so it's kind of stuck since I, I didn't give that myself that, that, that was that wasn't a marketing ploy on my behalf I, that was I was christened out by uh, Debbie <laughs> that's funny that's one heck of a nickname I'm just it wondering is. though why call you werewolf Mike and not werewolf Ian well um okay I, I, I come from an old family and um Normally, the first male born, uh, given the first name Ian, uh, my grandfather was Ian Malcolm. And then the, mid the middle name is normally taken as the first name. Uh, and in my case, it's Michael. Ah, I see. That makes good sense. Yeah, well, okay. Mike, I'm just going to call you Mike, of course, for the course yeah. of the show here instead of Ian. Because, yeah, there is something about the way that flows off the tongue. Werewolf Mike has got a great ring to it. So it I'm just going to yeah. do, do it that way. But, Mike, you've been busy since you came on the show last time. What have you been up to? You've had some experiences. Yeah. Um, I'll say recently, uh, since August last year, uh, basically due to... Um, family concerns um i normally don't sort of get to get out uh weekend days so i'm having to um early hours of the morning or early hours in the evening and of course since we're in uh, the norm northern hemisphere you know we're sunrise isn't till about sort of half six seven o'clock so when i'm going to the woods at about four between four and four thirty in the morning it's still pretty pitch black and uh when i'm driving uh between two locations uh, i stop off uh, a place called nooney woods which i normally uh visit uh weekends uh, when i'm back in reading and there's a like i say there's a country lane dead man's lane and um normally i, I sort of stop there for about 10 15 minutes have a walk around and um Sometimes, you, you know, an awful lot of nothing happens. And sometimes, um, you know, I, I get something like um, early January uh, this year. Um, I hear like this scraping sound. And it's, you know, it's, it's um, I, I thought it was dry leaves on the tarmac road. And then I realized actually, you know, it'd been, it was fairly damp. You know, it had been raining the night before. And um, a lot of the leaves are, are sodden and wet. And then whatever it is, he's actually walking around me. And I quickly sort of catch on. These these are like um, nails or claws scraping the tarmac when it's walking around me. 
I mean, I couldn't see it. Uh, say our, our um, uh, great wolves or werewolves or dogmen here uh, have the ability to cloak. Um, but I could hear it. And it, it was very, you know, like a definitive scraping sound. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when I began to realize it was circling me, because um, I was stood in the middle of the road. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the first time I've ever heard this sound, but you know, it's sort of like, uh, it kind of had me uh, nervous. And um, it, it only lasted like two two or three minutes. And then um, I said, all right, I, I, I've got to go. Because one thing I do, um, when I do these early morning trips, is you know I'm always constantly talking to them, even though, um, you know, I've got my torch and I'm flashing into the the undergrowth and in the tree line, uh, hoping to spot them. Um, I'm always continuously talking because you know I believe, um, like a lot of uh, Sasquatch uh, researchers, you know, they they continuously talk in the woods and you know they believe they they can hear it or sort of um yeah, the verbal communication so that's what i'm doing and um last friday morning I, I made a short video and towards the end uh there was one um just to my right on the other side of the gate and it had two young ones and um as i said i sent you the picture uh you know where the head is uh clearly visible uh and <coughs> In between uh, some uh, bush and trees, but it had a couple of young ones with it, and the young one just kind of like dipped down. It was so quick. But uh, as I say, you know, as a flash in the light, you know, it kind of fl uh, flashes its teeth, you know, because you know, it can't stand the light. It's a bit of frustration. So that was last Friday, and then uh, last uh, November, uh, I was visiting a place called. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a place called Glass House in uh, Gloucestershire, and it's—I uh, I probably said in um, a previous episode—it's it's a very spooky place. It's uh, sort of borders the uh, Severn River, which is divided between England and Wales. And um, I've been there a couple of years um, before. Well, actually, before uh, the outbreak of uh, COVID here in the UK and I, I sort of visited um, a few times maybe two three four times and uh, you know they they were getting used to me and then we had uh, the lockdown and I, I didn't sort of go for a couple of uh, years <coughs> and then uh, November uh, I can't remember which date precisely but it was a Sunday afternoon and I eventually went there and the, the place where I go, because uh, it, it's quite a huge area, again, there's a steel gate, you walk around it, and there's a pathway, it goes up, and then there's a fork, you go left or you can go right. But this time I I just decided to go right, because I, I previous on all previous visits, I, I'd always sort of turn left. So anyway, this time I went right, and as you're walking up, there's a, they push a tree right in the middle of the um, of the path. And as I'm getting up towards this tree, and I'm starting to get in this uh, sense of foreboding, this sense of um, pushback, and it's sort of like, well, you know, if you get over the tree, um, which I mean, I did climb over the tree, you know, that that sense of feeling, that sense of um, disappointment, uh, you know, it was quite prominent and. Because I, I promised that I would come back to see them, and I hadn't been back. I just had this sense of real frustration with me, this sense of um, disappointment. Yeah, and I get again this sense of like you know you you promised to come and see us, and um, I, I just find myself sort of saying, "Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." And I was I was there for about forty five minutes, maybe fifty minutes, <coughs> and. Um, Climb back over the log, 
over the tree and I'm walking down and um, I've got my phone camera in reverse so you know it's filming behind me but as I get down towards the junction I turn around and there's one there that, that you know it's just absolutely blacker than black it was about six seven foot tall and he was looking at me but um, on the video uh, I recorded uh, you could just make out the head pushing out the bushes looking at me so um, you know I promised to come back I mean I, I always leave some uh, treats uh, pork chops uh, I've started leaving pork chops now and sausages as opposed to sausage rolls and bacon um, so I've had um, an experience up at May Lane uh, when was that? Sorry, Vic. <coughs> I'm just <clears throat> I'm just getting over. Uh, had a really nasty cold um, about a month ago. And I just can't shake the cough. So apologies for any um, <laughs> any interference. So anyway, um, uh, I was up at May Lane. And I, I go, which is not far from my grandmother's house, and. Um, I've been going up there sort of Saturday, Sunday evenings. And again, it's just dead quiet. It's really, it's a really spooky place. And um, say sometimes, you know, you can hear like barking in the woods and you think, oh, maybe that's the deer. And there's a lot of partridges around there, uh, which are used for, by the farmers for shooting parties that, you know, come up. Uh, but this one time, uh, I was making a, uh, a short video and off to the right there was like two or three cubs and off to the left um, it was an adult and again you know I got this really high um, high power torch you know that can see right right through the foliage and again you know I get the flash of teeth you know the annoyance of the fact that I'm shining this thing uh, this torchlight in the adult size Again, you know, you, you can, and, and when you slow down the video, you, you can definitely, it's got like golden eyes. <coughs> um, but again, you know, the, the lips curl up and you can see the teeth. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, get that light out of my eye. But, um, yeah. So, really, it's, um, I've, I've booked a um, day off work uh, this month. And I'm hoping to get out in about in daylight hours uh, and sort of um, get into the tree line and uh, get in the undergrowth and see what come sort of pops up. But uh, lately, it's, it's just been sort of confined to early um, morning hours. But the the really strange thing is the stillness. Um, like Dead Man's Lane, May Lane, uh, even going back to Glass House in Gloucestershire, the um, even, even even this 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 visit to Glass House was um, in broad daylight, but again, it's just that that heavy stillness that that um, oh, it's, it's pretty hard to describe. It's it's the um, like a heavy atmosphere. There's like a a quiet, um, you know, to surroundings that you know that uh, sort of makes you want to sort of tread lightly. I can understand why you would want to tread lightly when you know yeah. the <laughs> Yeah. I'm wondering, Mike. You put yourself in their presence so often. Do you think? it's ever possible to fully trust these guys. Maybe if you focused on one and kept going back to where this one particular dog man was time after time, do you think it's ever possible to have a situation where you can actually trust a particular dog man? Uh, we'll put it this way. Um, overall, um, I, I know I've talked about 
I think in the first episode I did it with you, I, you know, I, I mentioned um, there were a couple of moments where, you know, I, I was absolutely petrified. Uh, and, and in one, one spot, I was actually rooted. But... Um, so far, so good. I mean, there may come an occasion where something might happen that could um that you know could lead could lead to me probably being taken down but um uh, of all the places that i've visited or i've been to either with um associates or by myself um there, there has there has been you know when you go to a new area you, and they always seem to know that you're looking for them and there was always this sort of this pushback like they're projecting fear onto you like to make you go away i mean like first when i was in nooney woods i mean they, they put me through the ringer like for six eight months and when they realized i wasn't going to go away they just sort of step back that sort of accepted it and this is why i've said in some occasions you know repetition is key once they think you're up there you're on their side think things can be um can be okay but i'm sure there might be a situation where there might be one uh that obviously acts and thinks differently and could, you know, it could be fatal. I mean, I, it, it's not like um, <clears throat> I'm off to the woods to, you know, to see my uh, canine friends. I mean, I, I, if I if I'm in an area where I I do start feeling a bit uncomfortable, I I walk back, I walk away. But if I'm in areas where I know where they are and um, they let me do my thing uh, everything's good but that's like places like uh, May Lane um, Nooney Woods Glass House is a 50-50 situation <clears throat> um, there's uh, there's a wood outside Winsford in Cheshire that I've been with with David and, and a friend of his, Danny. And they're more curious than um, than aggressive. Um, I mean, when I was up there with Danny uh, last March, we actually witnessed a tree being pushed over by one of these things, and we we, we were walking along the pathway. And suddenly we just started seeing this tree rock back and forth and then it just got pushed over. And the thing was, Danny and I accepted that it's just like normal. Because, you know, we, we've sort of been doing this thing for quite a few years now. So like in a way it didn't surprise us or we weren't like in awe or like, wow, that's amazing. I said, oh, oh okay, let's push the tree over. We'll, we'll carry on. Now, when Danny started going into these woods, and I mean, we got some pictures. Uh, I mean, there's some real humdingers. I mean, big, big, big ones around Winsford. And, um, you know, when Danny started going in there originally, or, uh, or Danny and David in these woods in uh, Winsford, um, yeah, you know, they, they, they had a few bluff charges and... Um, like absolute fear of God being projected onto them. But, you know, once they realized that the guys weren't going to go away and they were leaving treats as like a peace offering or as a gesture of goodwill, they kind of um, take a step back. And uh, I'm not saying there's like a, an ongoing working relationship with these things, but there's like a, 
uh, a give and take relationship. Now, the one thing I, I've always found is that, especially around Uni Woods, is that the Cubs, uh, I, like I say, I, I told you before, I've had instances where I'm sat down, I'm like, uh, a cup of coffee and a sandwich, and one of them just run right up to me and then run away. Or in the one instance where I find a cub in a den and I've left it bacon. And, um, you know, over a weekend, um, you know, the parents are watching. So they, they, they had enough trust in me to get within three, five foot of this cub. I mean, I think if I tried to touch it, I think I would have been. Chop suey. I would have been sushi for us, no, absolutely. But the fact that they allowed me to get that close and take pictures of it shows a certain level of trust in me. But whether that's just that group in Nooney Woods, uh, because like I say, I you know uh, repetition is key, and obviously I'm just going there morning. Um, evening, weekends. So, you know, it must reach a point where they they know me quite well. Uh, May Lane, when I started going up there, that was, um, I, I, I was absolutely, um, I, I, I was scared. But there was, um, there was there was a feeling of like what the hell are you doing here? You know we don't want you here. But I kept going back, and after a while, it was, it was like a certain level of acceptance. Uh, glass house. <coughs> uh, it was um, again a, a sense of I, I could feel it straight away. Um, because that, there was a chap, um, I, uh, I think you've interviewed him, Dean Cooling, and we were sort of messaging each other, and I, I sort of said I'm about this pack in uh, in Glasshouse, Gloucestershire. I said, would it be any relation to the pack uh, near you? And he, he said, it's one of the same. They span both sides of the Seven River. And um, a, a person has gone missing uh, in the woods at Glass House. Uh, there, there were some missing persons uh, posters uh, posted up and around um, one side of the woods near a public car park. But um, again, I, I think they seem to know that you're looking for them. They respond in a way of um, like sometimes it feels like how, how the hell do you know that we're here and two we're, we're going to try and push you away because we, we just want to be left alone and then you know you keep going back and after a while it's almost like well okay he's here just get on with it you know and but there's um I think last time I told you, there was a situation in December 2018 when I was in Nooney Woods. And there was one, uh, I was just in a clearing. And there was one that was sticking its head up out of the bush. And then I suddenly ha had this feeling that there was one to my left and there was one to my right. But they weren't in a offensive or defensive posture, but they were in a way that they could switch to it, you know, to an offensive <coughs> posture or, or, or revert to a, a defensive stance. But I just suddenly felt that the one in front was a distraction. And I think that's, I think that's the only time where I've suddenly gone, oh my God, you know, come on, wake up. You've got to, you've got to keep on your toes. You've got to keep uh, looking left and right, up and down. Because, you know, you know, sometimes it, it's like you get to a point where you do get complacent because you get so used to it. You get so used to them. And it's just 
always that one opportunity where you suddenly realize that hang on they're, they're, they're sort of um psyching you out or they um they're testing you now it, it was strange that um it, it took me i mean it didn't take me forever but you know it took me a couple of seconds to realize what was going on because i would heard so many times like from previous <coughs> um from previous shows that i'd listened to sort of 2015 2016 uh, period where you know like there was one um especially like uh from the north american experiences where oh there was one stood there then i realized there was like two or three more to my left and right behind me so it's almost like the one in front is uh, a diversion and the other two are obviously in a sort of semi ambush position where they could um think right okay it, he or she is a threat and that's it but um i've had uh the, the one experience um where i found some tracks and um i just i just sort of felt you know obviously it, it was great i was quite excited finding these tracks and i was following and I suddenly i had this feeling that whatever it was you know it was like 200 meters in front of me and it was absolutely hungry and it was going to eat and kill whatever but still i thought okay I'm, I'm out but sometimes i like to think that it was kind of warning me because this 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 sense of, of fear that was overwhelming me it was like as i got closer it was like look i'm so hungry i'm, I'm just gonna eat anything that comes across my path so i like to think that maybe I was being warned to go away but um yeah i i, I think that there may come a day where i, I just did no, no matter how much experience you gain um or learn or from what others have to say uh who, who knows i mean there, there may come a point where i just completely read a situation the wrong way and you know something might happen to me that's, that's the, <coughs> <coughs> sorry i think that's the uh long most long-winded answer i could give to that one <laughs> No, it's a good answer. I just hope that that never does happen to you, but you know, it is. You could be wiped out walking across the street, walking your dog. So, yeah, you never really do know. The question's already pouring in for you, Mike. The first one would be from Truth Iris, and they want to know what's your vocation? What well, hobby? Your job. Oh, uh, corporate security. I'm a shift supervisor. Uh, um, I work Monday to Friday, 60 hours a week, uh, in an office complex in Reading. And when you're not doing that, you're out there chasing those dogmen around. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> Good man. I've got another one for you from Alice. Alice wants to know, and by the way, Alice, you didn't put your question in all caps. I almost missed it. Everyone, if you have a question for Mike, please be sure to put it in all caps. That way I won't miss it. But Alice's question is, do you think Dogman and Bigfoot have any sort of relationship with each other? Um, I'm I, sorry, yeah. any sort of relation with each other? I, I've heard, I, I've heard like, you know, other witnesses, uh, like on your program, where they've been seen cooperating with each other. But, I, I firmly believe, uh, certainly in this country, um, that uh, great wolves here uh, take uh, sort of young or juvenile Sasquatch here as food. And I, um, I've never heard of an account here in this country where both have seen cooperating or in some sort of social 
uh, relationship with each other. But that's not to say that um, that they do. I'm pretty sure maybe in um, North America, Canada, um, there is some sort of level of cooperation. But I think here, um, they um, uh, the wolves will um, eat um, uh, sort of young or juvenile uh, sabe, sasquatch. Uh, people, I mean, um, well, <coughs> north of Reading, <coughs> sorry, there, there's definitely like a, a, a demarcation line in the woods where uh, the wild men stay on one side and the wolves stay on one side uh, uh, of this sort of like borderline, this demarcation line. I mean, I, 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 yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Please continue. Yeah, I've got to say, because I mean, I um, in eight years since I've been doing this, I mean, I've seen the uh, Sasquatch or the well vast people um, up in the woods on one side. I've seen them seven times um, in eight years, but they never seem to be further south of a particular marker, which is a footpath, actually, uh, a wood trail. And I've never seen them south. And they seem to be there between sort of uh, January, February, March, going into April. And then they seem to um, leave this area. And uh, the walls, the canines come back in. Because I think it's a heavily populated canine area. But the uptick in canine activity is sort, of, sort of like late April, May. And that's when the first cubs appear. What you said sorry. about how they normally... Oh, I'm sorry. Please continue. I thought you were done. No, no, no. no, no. Carry on, Vic. No, please. Yeah, go on. What you said about them normally <laughs> not mixing, that's how it is over here in the United States for the most part. Every once in a while, you'll have a credible eyewitness come forward and report seeing them together, but... That's very, very rare. In most cases, it seems like over here, just like over there, they seem to mix like oil and water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I, I mean, there's... Um, I mean, I, I, I've listened to people that obviously have communication with uh, Sasquatch and, you know, they, um, they've sort of communicated to people that they, they don't like the wolf people, as they call them. So I, I would assume that um, there is a certain indifference between the two. But I, I personally in the UK, I, I've never heard or witnessed um, uh, a meeting or a, a grouping. But uh, certainly from my own experience, uh, uh, north of Reading, they, they definitely seem to sort of um, uh, stay apart from each other. And then come into late uh, late spring, um, let's say the Sabe people here, they, they seem to go somewhere else and then the canines literally have full control or run of all of the woods where I go to. <coughs> that just makes researching that much better for you. It does? Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> The next question up would be from UFO Drone Guy, and he wants to know or is saying, Hi there, Mike. Have you ever had an encounter in or near the Essex area, southeast UK? Oh, um, no. Um, there, is, uh, there is a lot of uh, activity. I mean, especially the big cats, uh, the big felines, you know, the leopards and the panthers. Um, a lot of cats down there, big cats. Um, I, I believe that there is uh, Suffolk on the other side of the Thames estuary. Um, so you're going into obviously um, uh, Essex, uh, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire. There's a lot of canine activity. Uh, north of the Thames estuary and then um, on the south side so when you're going into Kent that way 
Um, again, there's an awful lot of um, big cat activity, but I think most of the canine activities, certainly Norfolk and Suffolk, but Essex is, um, you, you get a lot of wild man activity down there, as well as uh, the, the sort of panther and the, uh, the leopard. A lot of big cat activity down there. Sure sounds to me like you have these guys mapped out pretty effectively. I'm oh impressed. yeah, yeah. No, there's a couple of there's a couple of guys here who, um, well, actually, you know, before before the, um, I mean, the, the wild man, um, you know, the survey, the Sasquatch uh, type uh, person in the UK is is rich in English oral and written history. But also, so are the big cats, and I mean the werewolves, the the great wolves. They they've always been sort of uh, put on a on the back burner. But certainly regarding um, uh, the big cats uh, and uh, the wild man, you know, there's 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 a lot more sort of oral and written tradition in English uh, folklore and history. As opposed to the canine, so that there's a lot of um, <coughs> there's certainly an awful lot to go on. Um, you know, if you want to follow the big cats, um, and there, there are, in fact, there, there are, I think there's two two big cat associations uh, that track and map these things. But there's there's one guy called Jonathan. I've got any surname, uh, but he, he's he's. Um, I'm pretty sure some of the more English listeners, uh, when they listen to the show, will realise who I'm talking about because he's he was famous for making a um, a cookery book on roadkill. <laughs> he goes he goes around some of the country roads <laughs> collecting roadkill and and he cooks it. And he, I think he did a roadkill recipe cookbook, but um, he, he's been interviewed a few times. Jonathan McGowan is his name, Jonathan McGowan, and I think he's probably the the, the best big cat expert that we have in this country. And he's got a website. I, I, I I'm pretty sure if you just Google Jonathan McGowan big cats, you, you'll find it pretty easily. But he, he, if you know, if you want proof positive, go to that guy's website. But um, yeah, um, and then regarding um, the Bigfoot, uh, well, our English Bigfoot, you've got um, <coughs> obviously uh, BBR, uh, dummy as well. Uh, you got the Winter Hill group there on Facebook. Um, but I, I think the only, no, obviously I'm, I'm going to be blowing my own trumpet here, but um, the I think the only group dedicated to English great wolves or um, werewolves or dogmen um, is what I call the TGWA, it's the Great Wolf Association. And it's only about eight or nine members, but we have an awful lot of uh, associates uh, in Germany and here in the UK and Ireland and Scotland uh, who, who are primarily more dedicated to researching and uh, <laughs> logging and reporting uh, cane access canine activity in this country because uh, sure. you know yeah sorry go on. no i'm sorry please after you i was going to say because uh you, you find a lot of activity is more centered towards the, the sort of wild man the bigfoot um sort of thing but you know to to sort of say um which in, in a way is more believable as the sort of saying, well, by the way, do you know there's uh, like walking canines in this country as well? 
you know, which is, I think, a harder pill to swallow than saying that there's a wild man living in the woods, which I think is more acceptable to a lot of people. <coughs> oh, it definitely is. It definitely is. Sounds like you've got the UK pretty well covered with researchers. If anything happens, I don't think that there would be a researcher that far from where it occurred. At least that's how it sounds. Well, it, it's... Um, well, a couple of them are law, law enforcement and um, they're rural police officers. And, um, there's um, uh, a couple in Germany. But essentially... Um, that there's uh, obviously David and Danny in, in Cheshire. Uh, there's some people I can't name simply because of their their jobs, because you know they're sort of tied in with the um, sort of local government type work, and you know there there, there is a penalty, uh, you know, loss of earnings and loss of pension, which for a subject which really officially doesn't exist for a creature. Um, that belongs in myth. You know, it's it's. Um, you know, I, I know one instance. Um, uh, you know, the guy said he'd lose his. He'd never work in this country ever again. So. Um, it's it's actually. <laughs> It's actually trying to, one of the worst things is, is actually, um, I know David's tried this, you know, trying to get farmers to open up. And I, I think uh, we've only, I think David and Danny, uh, I think, found one guy, found a farmer uh, outside of Winsford. This is going back a couple of years, and this, this is what David uh, relates to me, was that um, a farmer thought a bull was out in the field, and, you know, it got out of its paddock and it was just wandering around the field. So you can already imagine the size of this thing, if it's about the size of a full grown bull. So hops over the fence, starts walking towards the, what he thinks is his bull, trying to get it back into the paddock. He says, as he's getting closer and closer to it, he suddenly stands up on two legs. And he's thinking, that ain't no effing bull. He said, it looks more like a massive dog. But it stood on two feet. And then it starts walking towards him, slowly. And he said, this thing was huge. He said he couldn't sort of guess its height, but it was big. And he said, I just, you know, uh, David said that the farmer just turned around and just walked back as quickly as he could back to um, his vehicle on the road. I got over the fence. He said, as he turned around, he said, this thing had gone back on all fours and, and gone into the woods. Can you imagine how shocked that farmer must have been? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Here you think it's a bull and. It stands up and it's as big as a bull on two legs. Mm. They grow to be 12 feet around here in the States. How big do they get over there? Do you know? Oh, well, I, I think we've had, um, we've got the standard issue seven, eight footers. Um, but uh, I would say the, the insomniac chap who reported to you in October 2017. Uh, you saw one um, where, where he saw his in Reading was actually on the southern edge of Nooney Woods, and that was 10 foot. Um, I've come across one uh, where this, I think this is May 2018. And I, 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 like I say, I, I should drive this Skoda Octavia. It's a five-door family saloon, 1.8 litre. I park up, <coughs> and 
walk into a, a open um, an open area before I hit the tree line. And as I'm walking up to the tree line, I look over to my right. It's a beautiful hot day. So the tree canopy is pretty hanging over. It's low to the ground, lots of shade. And I just noticed this size of the head because it's got a jowl. I can see the left side of the head, the ear, and the head must have been, been about three foot across, easy. And this thing is looking at me. Uh, I went, you all right, mate? I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm going back to the car and I'm going home, okay? So I turn around, <laughs> get in the car, and I wait. Um, I wait for him to pop up. And I, I took about two, three pictures, and I left. So uh, that was a Saturday. Went back on the Sunday, and I found the area where he'd been lying down. So he he must have crept from under the tree all the way through the grass before he stuck his head up to have a look at me. And I measured it. And in terms of width and length, it was the same size as my car. And this thing must have been about I would must have been about twelve foot easy. Wow. I mean, I've I, I mean, I've got I've found a sixteen inch print, but the biggest one I've ever found was twenty two inches, and I reckon this belonged to what I call the big boss, and I only ever managed to get about two two photos of him in seven years, and wow. he looked. He, 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 like I said, he was about the size. If you look up the size of a four-ton Bedford Army truck, British Army, a four-ton Bedford truck, that's how big he would have been on for all fours. And I mean, this this thing, uh, he looked like he'd seen it, done it, repeat, seen it, done it, repeat. He had a look in his face like he just couldn't give a flying F anymore. He was just too long in the tooth to get excited about anything. He, he just looked like really, he, he was, he just looked ready to leave this mortal coil. He had a really, really tired look about him. You know? I'm sure he had seen and done everything. And when you're that big and you're a dog, man, I don't think you have to worry about much trouble. I think everything else breaks, gets, does whatever they can. They get the heck out of your way. At least if they have any common sense, they would. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, he, he um, December 2018 uh, was the first time I saw him. And I think the following year was probably April. March or April 2019. Uh, I was walking, uh, I was in Nooney Woods, walking uh, along this wide path around to the right, and he was up there, sat in, on the ground, uh, sort of half in and out of some bushes. I was about 300 meters. I took a picture of him, and uh, as I went to look at the picture, I looked up, and he was gone. But he wow. just had this, he just had this real, um, really, really tired look about him. Really, um, really long in the tooth. He probably was ready to check his if he's been around mm. that long. So you're yeah. probably right about that. I've got another question for you, Mike, from UFO Drone Guy. His question is, Mike, do you have Mike, did you have a bad encounter in Tetford Forest? Oh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. One, 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 um, it was a weekend. And uh, I had, there was four locations I wanted to visit. Now, from Reading to Thetford, it's about a four and a half hour drive. So I left at about half three in the morning. And I was, my idea, my plan was to spend um, uh, an hour in each location. There was four locations. 
and um, Thetford Forest is just like as soon as you get out there, you're just you know there's something not right with that place. I was on my toes the whole time, and um, there, there was a location where uh, when I stopped for lunch, and I had something uh, thrown at the car. I, <laughs> I was sat in the car on the lunch, and this thing landed plumb dead centre. Oh, I nearly pooed my pants because I was already feeling nervous. But um, on the last location I wanted to visit, there was um, there were some structures, and um, about maybe. Uh, maybe 100 meters or so to my right there was a structure and all I could see was a pair of golden eyes looking back at me and like a black shape and I did take a picture but I could see this thing and I thought you know um, time to check out I'm going home but yeah Thetford Forest is it's just like you, you're just on your toes the whole time it's just a weird place. I mean, um, uh, Rendlesham, I think it's about 70, 80 miles south. You know, Rendlesham UFO um, encounter with the US Air Force personnel back in the early 1980s. It's down there. I mean, Suffolk, Norfolk um, it, it is a weird place. I mean, I think it's... Um, one of the most famous encounters uh, for a dogman werewolf, uh, 1577. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a village, and 44 people were killed inside a church by one of these things. It, apparently, it was like one of the worst storms, storms in recorded history. And this uh, dogman burst into the church, and whether it was scared of, of the lightning, sheet lightning, or the storm, because all the people were in the church praying to God, hoping to go away. And this thing burst in and I think killed about 43 people, 44 people. But the thing is, the claw marks are still on the inside of the church door to this day. Wow. So, um, and it's not far from an abbey. Uh, again, this is in Suffolk. Uh, they were uh, excavating an old abbey that had been abandoned for about a thousand years. But in one of the graves where the monks were buried, they found the remains of a canine that was seven foot tall. Huh. I wonder what that could have been. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I've got another question for you from Lena Grinsleyet. Grinsleyet. Yet. And her question is, have you had some pictures which you've taken disappear from your camera? Um, no, but I've had videos. I, I mean, I've got a small YouTube channel. Nothing exciting or shit to shout about. But I've had videos because um, I didn't upload for, a, for about nearly three years because one time I had 21 videos, then I had 16 videos. So I had five videos go missing. And then there was uh, 20 videos, so four have been put back, but there was one that, that was never returned, and I just thought, oh my God, I'll leave it. I've had pictures where one, one of the best ones I ever got was, uh, you know, where I told you about where one June Saturday evening I was going to go out camping, and there was nine of them waiting for me. I, which had never happened to me before. And then I went to another location and I got four of them walking and all four was Indian in, in um, single file. And they, the way they looked was exactly like the one from um, all those guys that used to you know, mountain monsters. Did you remember that those chaps? <laughs> those, 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 you know the guys I'm talking about. How can I forget? 
Uh, but there was one there was one farmer who had this uh, seven foot black canine come out of a woodshed, and they were exactly like that. Beautiful, beautiful things. And you know, I was showing my messes, and I was like, "Look at that! That is awesome!" I was so I was so amazed. You could see four of them clearly defined, one behind the other, and then the picture started to fade. All you can see now is, is just a faint outline of them. But on the evening, you know, obviously when I when I got back home, she was like, "Oh, you see, you, you know, <laughs> you scared, are you? Yeah, get the rabbit." I was like, "Well, yes." And then uh, I showed her the picture, and she was like, "Because uh, you know, she were, really wasn't into it. You know, she was too. She was like, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, sit down, and have a cup of tea, shut up." And then I showed her this picture. She was like, "Oh my God, yeah, you can see them clearly." And over a period of uh, days, the picture started to fade. I was, I was, and all. You you can see the the first one just about but the other three almost gone and um that but i've never had pictures taken off my phone no <coughs> i've had videos taken off my channel and then put back after a period of time but one one has been permanently uh taken off It's a shame you have to worry about that. You go through all the work to take these pictures and collect evidence, and then something like that happens. It really is a shame. Yeah. Got another question from you from Blood Viper, and his question is, Mike, what would you say was the most horrific encounter that you've had, and where was it? Oh, that was... Um, okay. The one, the one where I was absolutely pooing it. Uh, I, I, I I mean, um, was a, I said earlier, uh, I mentioned on a previous show where I found these wonderful tracks and I'm following them and I suddenly got this urge that there's something 200 meters ahead of me and it was hungry and it didn't give a flying fig what it was, it was going to kill and eat it and I, I, I was, I was absolutely petrified and there was another time, uh, February 12th, that's when, this is when I had three of them and uh <coughs> excuse me uh sunday morning about 9 30 feb 12 uh 2017 get out of the car i'm feeling pretty buoyant actually i i, I was um I'm, i i am literally like four months into the hobby and for some reason i was feeling pretty complacent i walked around the gate um oh um along some open ground and one just came out of the undergrowth on my left and it was moving from left to right and it went up on two legs and turned left into the tree line and I was absolutely rooted to the spot it could have uh, there was one to my left chase uh, chasing a, a pheasant and I heard it get caught and I heard, I heard it like the bones being crunched and then there was one behind me across the road that barked so loud that's what snapped me out of it. But when I saw this thing get out of the undergrowth uh, from left to right, I, I was I was absolutely uh, pooing it. I, I was absolutely petrified. And I was rooted to the spot in fear. I couldn't move. But when this thing, uh, the third one behind me, barked, it snapped me out of it. And that's when I, I, I went back to the car. I sat in there for about 10 minutes. And I thought, right, I'll put my big boy pants on. And I, I took some pictures, and that's when I noticed that out of the seven that I took, in three or four of them, there was like this black dot that was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was the one that um, had come up from my left and uh, on all fours, and then went up on two legs and turned left. So basically, it circled all the way back around and was coming up on my right to check on me. Uh, I mean, I've had... Um, I, I mean, like I say you can go to a place like Thetford or uh, Glass House. I mean, the first, um, even even going up to Canic Chase the first time, 
you can just feel like this vibe that there's something really off about these places. But uh, glass house, um, yeah, kind of on your toes. Bedford Forest. I would go back there one day, but I, I, I'm not in a rush to get back there. Let's put it that way. And if I did, I, I'd go with a, a busload of tourists just for safety. <laughs> <laughs> Now I understand. I've got one for you from Hades Pucci, which is Mike. Have you ever investigated in Dorset at all? One time. Um, I know. I know. There's a lot that goes on down there, and I think there's a very famous picture of one. Um, that there's. Um, it's a big black one. It's on all fours, and it was a school teacher. Uh, uh, took a picture of it and she said it was about the size of a bison at her words um, I think there's even a, a video of one running alongside a car I think along one of the A roads uh, down in Devon uh, going to Cornwall and I think the only known uh, death um Attributed to one, uh, to one of these was a woman that died of shock after her two dogs were slaughtered in 1996. Down that way, but there, there's certainly, um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of activity down there. I, I've been down there uh, once for a long weekend, but there's, there's just not enough time to um, get around and, and sort of. <coughs> um, get to some of these like a, you, you really need to get a week off if, if i was to do devon or even the three counties uh which is i think worcestershire gloucestershire and uh shropshire i think you need about like two weeks to to really get around uh and investigate and certainly if you're going to uh, drive down to devon cornwall somerset I mean, there's a lot of activity in Somerset as well, but uh, for some place like Devon, you you would you would need at least um, probably a good week. It's all like two weekends, five days, you know, Monday to Friday, and then two Saturdays, Sundays. But you you would have, you would have to be on the road pretty early till eight nine at night. That is a lot of time to set aside to research, so. Yeah, I oh, know, yeah. easier yeah. said than done. I've got another question for you. I guess it's a comment from Blood Viper. He says, I think Sasquatch and Dogmen move around, though only one of them is in any one place at any time. Um, <coughs> well, I know with the canine uh, uh, activity, um, I mean, if I was to take the Nuni Woods pack, they they they're there all the time. Um, they, they, there's like the last week of December in each year. They like ninety percent of them just seem to go somewhere. Uh, of which even to this day, I, I don't know. It seems to be like a rear guard that stays behind, just to keep an eye on the place. And then come April early May time, they're all back. I've noticed that the males sort of end of January, February start cropping up and then the females come about a month later when they're ready to give birth. But um, as a whole, like last week of December, like sometimes it's just, it's just nothing happening. It's just like no activity. And they just see, all seem to go somewhere. Uh, uh, and I, I really don't know where they go. So, um, for the wild men, um, end of March, they, they seem to move somewhere else. But um, they're, they're sort of out towards um, Goring, uh, strictly Pangborn, uh, on the, uh, probably on, let me see. Yeah, they'd be on the north side of the Thames, Thames River. 
but to me, there, there certainly seems to be like a uh, uh, a border demarcation uh, zone for for the both of them. So, um, I, I I would say the, the 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 canines here seem to be territorial. You know, they seem to be fixed in one territory. Um, I, I I really couldn't give an answer as to if the survey Sasquatch uh, wild man if they move around or or, or if they're territorial. Because I say that's not that's not really my um, main area of focus uh, of attention or research. Well, that can't be held against you. I mean. Sasquatch are awfully hard to pattern, just like dogmen. It's really hard to do. I've got another one for you from Just Andy. His question is, do they prefer colder climates? Would you see them in Spain or France? Oh, they, they, um, they're certainly in Spain, in uh, southern Spain. Um, I don't know whether it's Morocco or Tunisia, where they're actually officially recognized as part of their wildlife. I know they're certainly in Afghanistan. I mean, they're all over the place. The Hindu Kush, uh, India. Um, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I talked to a uh, couple of former Royal Marines that did tours of duty in Afghanistan. And, you know, like one of them said, you know, um, where their fire base was, um, most nights you used to get 10 or 12 of them just walk, walk in under the floodlights of the camp, under, you know, outside the front of the camp. And he, he said, what was curious, the last one used to stop and turn around and look up, look up at them, you know, just like total curiosity on the face and then they'd just walk off. He said, but they would always do this in all fours. Um, I mean, they're certainly down in southern Spain uh in grenada um eastern and southeastern france they're in the vosges uh right up in the north as well certainly in germany in western um uh down in the southeast and the northwest um they're everywhere that's how they are over here they're all over the place and it really doesn't come as any surprise to hear that that's how it is over there as well. I've got another one for you from Blood Viper. He wants to know, Mike, I've had encounters in Snowdonia in Cornwall. Have you ever investigated there? Uh, Snowdonia, that... Um, Cornwall, no. Snowdonia, I, I've been to um, Southern Wales twice, uh, Sahawi Forest. And I, I was put in contact with a, a chap that lives 10, 10 miles southwest of, um, oh, I forgot the name of the town. But it's, it's, it's near Sahawi Forest. I've had two encounters there. But certainly, um, Snowdonia, uh, I know Dean Cooling has had a, an encounter up there. Um, uh, this Welsh guy that I talked to that had his encounter 10 miles southwest of Sahawi Forest, um, he, he was a hospital worker, and that, that really, um, and he was just out walking, uh, you know, for a Sunday stroll, and this thing just stood right up in front of him, less than 10 feet, and it freaked him out. Well. Wow. I'll bet that did freak him out. I can understand why. Um, I, I, it's just, you know, it's just like, I, I've got this really long to-do list. I mean, I want to go back up to Scotland. Um, I'm going up to Yorkshire in May, uh, back up to Danes Dyke and um, where old Stinker roams. Um, I'm hoping to do some, I've got a week off in March, so there's a couple of locations I want to visit then. But um, it's, it's just like, 
um, <coughs> the, the only way I, I, I could get a lot more traveling, uh, a lot more uh, research done is if I was to retire early and um, get out there and Monday to Friday driving up and down and, and do it that way. But at the moment, like I say, you know, I'm, I'm to work and, um, you know, with family issues, it's pretty hard at the moment. I mean, I certainly have had to curtail a lot of my workload, uh, you know, in terms of research since August last year. But um, if the opportunity arises, I mean, if I was to uh, get back down to Cornwall, uh, Devon, I would. But I, I think the only way I, I, I would really get back to a lot, like, I mean, I've not even had a good chance to go up to North Wales. But there's a lot of activity. Um, or even Mid Wales. Um, but it's, it's just really like Lincolnshire. I want to go back to uh, <coughs> Suffolk. Um, but yeah, I, the only way would be to take early retirement, and that way I, I, I could I could get to all these places Monday to Friday, week in week out. Well, as you know, they're not going anywhere. Whenever you are ready to no. retire, they're going to be there. So no yes. biggie on that no. <laughs> at all. The next one up on deck is from Sheila R. And Sheila's question is. You're very brave knowing one of these times could be your last. Is it worth it? Yes. Absolutely. Well, that didn't take you long to answer. That's good. No. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said before, it, it, if it does, um, uh, you know, if it does come to some sort of fatal ending, I just hope I get to go to Valhalla. You know, it better be worth it. That's all I can say. Huh. So. Yeah. Hopefully that won't happen. But if yeah. one does take you out, just imagine <laughs> the conversations. You're probably going to be talking to a guy who is going to tell you about dying from choking on a ham sandwich. And then when it's your turn, <laughs> your story is going to be so much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to say I can beat that, mate. No problem. <laughs> yes, you will be able to if that happens, which, like I said, hopefully yeah. it won't. But oh. <laughs> the next one up for you is from Ramsey Morris. And Ramsey's question is, what is your opinion on them being extraterrestrial? Oh. Um, okay. I, I, I think... Personally, I, I, I think they're earthbound, they're flesh and blood, they come with a whole box of tricks. But I think the mechanics of how they came to be here may have had, uh, uh, or may have been a result of outside interference. But I, I, I don't think they are extraterrestrial I, I think they are of this earth they've been around a long time but how they came to be the way that they are I, I, I now begin to believe that they are the result of outside influence uh, same as the Sabe but I know that there's an awful lot of uh, I, I know Scott Carpenter did uh, before he, he sadly passed away um, you know he did a book uh, that was based on uh, DNA research. And, you know, the 90% is female and like 10 or 6% of the Sasquatch male DNA is of unknown origin. But some, but the, the level of uh, bioengineering required would, would have meant something as an outside source. And I think the same applies to the dogman, great wolf, werewolf. I mean, even if you go to the early legends, I mean, it was Native American, you know, uh, the coyote spirit tri uh, tricking um, 
the creator, you know, to making them like a man or uh, a king. Oh, I've forgotten his name. Uh, king Lysus of Arcadia tricking Zeus into eating um, meat that turned out to be his uh, dead son. And as his punishment, he turned him into a man wolf. So again, you know, there, there's that sort of um, inference that there is some sort of sort of bioengineering by a, a greater power or a greater authority. But I, I certainly come to the, for me, uh, they are of this earth. Um, they're flesh and blood. They're biological. They can do a great many things which a lot of people would think would be considered supernatural. But um, how they came to be, I think, was the result of outside uh, influence. Something from above. You just might be right. You never know. <laughs> The next one up is from the Sober Carper, and they want to know where they can see your pictures. Oh, um, uh, BBR. I used to post on there. There's a few UK uh, dogman uh, sites. I mean, I, I've sent you some, Vic. Um, I, I'm not currently a member of any Facebook uh, dogman UK page I, I i mean i i do run a private group on uh, telegram but um th no there are there are pictures um on different facebook um sort of cryptid uh, groups um dogman uk uh bbr um i i, I got my own sort of youtube channel uh, like I say, it's no, it's no big, big thing. I mean, I, I do say on there a couple of times on some of the videos, so if you have the ability to download them, you can slow them down to like literally uh, frame a second and you'll see them because they, they move so quick. When you run the video at normal speed, you just think I'm out making fantastic videos of English countryside. But if you slow them down and you go them frame by frame, You'll see them pop up because they're, they're that quick. I'm sure the answer is going to be no, but would you mind if I posted a link to your YouTube channel in the description for tonight's show? No, no, no. You carry on, mate. That'd be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's the least I can do. Well, I'm going to do that then. I'm going to post that link. I'll make it really easy for the listeners to visit your channel and take a look at your evidence then. Yeah, feel um, feel free to make any comments. I mean, I you know you, you do get um, a few negative uh, comments, but you know it, it doesn't phase me. Yeah, it's like all bad. Yeah, it's kind of what you expect in some ways, at least to a certain degree. So, oh yeah, <laughs> no, I understand. The next one up is from Josie Maine Coon, and her question is, do you think the trail cam videos and pictures of dogmen are real or fake? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, do you know what? I, I, uh, from what I've seen, one or two of them might be a bit iffy, but I think overall, uh cam truck because i i know they can see the infrared um i think a lot of the cam trail stuff is is real but there, there are one or two where you, you could actually sort of go that doesn't look right you know it doesn't look like someone's you know trying their best to uh spin a yarn but that no that was an excellent question but yeah i i, I think um I would say a vast majority of, or a good portion of trail cam uh, film or photos are, are, are genuine. And then there, there, there are some that are a bit are a bit dodgy, to say the least, yeah. <laughs> some are very dodgy, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, it looks like Yvonne Marshall's in the chat, in the live chat room. Yvonne, thanks so much as always for listening. She said that she's been tuning into the show since 2018. And I believe oh. it. I've been seeing her comments for a long time now. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's from, yeah, she's from Cornwall. All right. Oh, she is. All right, the next one up is from UFO Drone Guy. And he wants to know, Mike, have you ever been followed because of your involvement with dogmen by the government? Yeah, now, um, I think I me I've mentioned this on the first uh, episode I did, or maybe the second, but yeah, there, there was a period where uh, 2019, uh, 2020, uh, I, I had some, I, I was definitely followed on three occasions, so I can be sure. We had an envelope of white powder. Uh, my dad had a, a phone call saying I was in hospital when I wasn't. I'd been in an accident and I was on um, um, life support, all this, all this crap. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, even one time when I was uh, getting fuel for my car here in Whitney, I went into pain. I was walking out. There's a silver beam, silver beam, BMW 5 Series with two dudes sat in it looking at me. And I was just like, oh my God. I looked at them and just say, like, you know, can you be obvious as you are? And, it, and they, they drove off. <laughs> but they were, yeah, they were eyeballing me. But you, I, 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 know, I know other people have had um, weird and wonderful uh, experiences. Yeah. I can only imagine the people who've contacted you. I've got another question for you from Chuman, and Chuman wants to know Hi, Mike. Any canine reports from Glouc Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire County Forest of Dean? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying. Glass House is in Gloucestershire. It's. Um... I think it's about eight, nine miles, uh, let me see, uh, east of the Forest of Dean. My, my sister lives down there. The structures, Forest of Dean, um, it's the same pack that goes into uh, Sahawi Forest and up into the Bracken Beacons. Um, I say they're, 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 uh, they're, they're big. A lot of them are predominantly jet, jet black, but Glasshouse, yeah, um, yeah, Gloucestershire is like, um, uh, oh, there's a, there's a chap who did a video, uh, the three counties werewolf. Let's say I think it's Gloucestershire, uh, Worcestershire, and Shropshire is the three counties. But yeah, the uh, Glasshouse, Gloucestershire. If you can get down there and have a uh, walk around there, yeah, there's a, there's a few in there. If anyone would know, you would. So, yes, yeah, the right yeah, person, yeah. definitely. Oh yeah, yeah. Gloucestershire is like a real, uh, like a real hot spot for them. Oh no, I believe it. Like I said, you would know. You definitely <laughs> would. <laughs> yeah. We're about out of time. Before we get out of here, though, Mike, do you have any closing comments you'd like to put out there for us? Um, uh, I'm, well, I just hope Dave's all right. Um, uh, I wish he could have made it. Um, and, um, yeah, just, just many thanks for having me back on, Mike. It's, it's been wonderful as always. And uh, thanks to everybody with all the questions. Um, yeah, thanks very much for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming back. Yeah, when I put it out there that you're going to be coming back on to do this live stream, there's a lot of interest. And in, yeah, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone because with all yeah. of your experiences, you're a very interesting listen. I just hope you keep doing what you do and you never give up and you never have any issues out there when you are beating the bushes because it goes without saying you're obviously a good man and I wish the best for you. Thank you very much, Vic. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks again for your time, Mike, and have a great night.
You too, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. We'll see you. Good night. Good night.